you to be here and uh, I want to thank everyone who's uh, able to attend. We, I think we have uh, a fairly light agenda and so uh, there probably be some time available in, in the second session, especially for questions or uh, new topics that we, we haven't considered. But uh, let's go ahead and go directly to Susan and uh, Lisa and the nursing subcommittee. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Susan Matney, and, uh, I, and I'm a co-chair with Lisa Anderson for the Nursing Link Subcommittee. And we give an update at every clinical LOINC meeting. And because there's so many people attending virtually um, uh, in this meeting, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about it. Um, this is uh, the landing page that, that LOINC has created for us. All of our uh, education that we give, the presentations, agendas, minutes are posted on this page. If you want to be a member, um, you need to sign up uh, to be a member, and we would love to have uh, new members. So um, we we have several alliances that uh, we interface with, the Alliance for Nursing Informatics, and that is a group that has many uh, different organizations as members, as specialty organizations and informatics organizations, terminology developers. Um, we are a member for LOINC, and they they do a lot with public policy and finding out what's going on with each other. So when we have policy coming forward with nursing, we talk to them. The Nursing Knowledge Big Data Initiative, uh, we work hand in hand with. So if you were on the previous, um, our presentation on pain, um, you will see that that has uh, been, con created through to now the development of the uh, first draft of the fire profiles. Oh, I misspelled. The next thing we're going to do is genio urinary. <laughs> Genito urinary and then falls. And so there are uh, there in, in the nursing knowledge big data initiative, there are is a group that does an initial knowledge model with with the assessments, the, the procedures or interventions, the, um, the problems or nursing diagnosis and the outcomes, and those come to the terminology working group who works collaboratively with the LOINC committee. Um, and then we also have an alliance with Logica. Logica has been a, a great supporter of, of the nursing knowledge of big data initiative and LOINC and um, is, is allowing me and others to get this data through to the standard space for, for nursing. So in the last year we've done, um, we, our goals is content creation and education. And so we've done an intro to FIRE. Um, we trained the Nursing Knowledge Big Data Terminology Group on uh, the developing of a LOINC submission. Um, LOINC has helped with that, SWAPNA, of fil filtered questions because sometimes these panels inside the side of panels and obtaining copyright and all the different things that we have to do is difficult. Um, Nathan Davis gave us a, 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 a presentation on the COVID-19 fire IG that we have developed, just a shameless plug. There is a fire IG out there with all of the labs, all the signs and symptoms, uh, every exposure um all the things you need to message uh, the COVID-19 up to hospitalization we don't have any of the hospitalization things in the fire ig but that is freely available for anybody that wants to use it and then um lisa works for the national quality um ncqa and so she gave us a a a, a tutorial on representing assistive devices in C ECQM. So we have um, the content that we've developed is that we're um, completing the pain assessment panel, the NPASS, the neonatal pain agitation and sedation scale is uh, gonna, is was just released 
and also as well as safe environment for every kid. And that is a social determinants of health instrument that is used within Intermountain Healthcare and actually across the industry uh, to document social determinants of health for children. So that, if you want to look at that in your LOINC browser, that is very interesting, interesting if you're doing any SDOH things. The future content, we're uh, still working on the pain instruments. Um, several are, are almost ready to be submitted. Uh, the NIFs, the revised flock, we did, did, we've discovered that the revisions is really more the definitions and not the codes. And so we, there's not really a, def, a revision to what's in LOINC besides the definitions. Um, and then these are some other pain scales. And like I said, we're going to be working on genital urinary assessment. And then um, with uh, peripheral and central IV assessment in a collaboration with the Vanguard project. And this is the interventional radiologists who are um, looking at uh, IV and central, and central venous catheter infections. And so they have created an information model that will compare to our nursing information model and get the content we need from LOINC for, for IV assessment. Just some observations. Um, this is a volunteer organization, so prog progress is slow. Um, we have knowledgeable, knowledgeable members who are willing to participate and, and share. Um, we've canceled several meetings just just because of our schedules and 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 life, but uh, it's it's really a a great group of of people. So I'll stop there and see if there's any questions and and um, observations from nurses that are on the on the line that want to say anything. We don't have any questions at the moment. Uh, are there any anything coming in? Give it just a minute. Well, the sun's on my face. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, no questions. No open questions at the moment. Of course, people can send those in whenever they think of them and we'll share them uh, when they do come up. Uh, let's see, hey. what is, yeah, go right ahead. Who's next? <laughs> I believe, let's see. Hey, I think, I think I'm next. I think you are, David, yeah. Okay, um, so let me just get my soft pairing. That would be two. Okay, so I'm going to be presenting just a quick update of the LOINC Document Ontology Subcommittee um, for this uh, previous period. So, uh, first of all, please, um, if you have any potential interest in documents, clinical documents, and you're not currently on the LOINC Document Ontology Subcommittee, please apply to join. Um, we have, uh, we meet monthly on a Tuesday afternoon, early afternoon, and we have lively discussions regarding topics um, surrounding submitted clinical documents and uh, the access values, which are linked parts and how they fit into the the five hierarchies of each of the axes of the document ontology. So it's, it's kind of an interesting discussion and that we have on a monthly basis. And if you're at all interested, please join. We are in need of a chair for that committee as well. So if you're on the committee and you're interested in being a chair or a co-chair, um, and even if you're not on the committee and you'd like to join and possibly be a chair, please uh, let us know because we really would like to have a chair for that committee uh, uh, coming from the, uh, the group. Another just general announcement is LOINC continues to publish the LOINC Document Ontology OWL file um, we know that there are users because we've 
gotten an occasional question on the link uh, in the link inbox, but we've gotten very little by way of like feedback on our feedback page. So we'd like to kind of, if anyone has an interest in using an OWL file um, and possibly um, making use of the ontology in an interactive way like that, please explore that and give us some feedback about, you know, the utility of that kind of, um, you know, information, because it would really help us in, in guiding, you know, this as a prototype for possibly, you know, presenting aspects of link in an ontological kind of format. The new document ontology um, uh, content from version 2.68, which was the June release, had uh, 3,023 LOINC terms uh, linked to 411 unique LOINC parts, which are those parts that are categorized in the five axes. So since the, the previous update, uh, we've had the addition of some new um, axis values. One was a kind of document called Adrenal Insufficiency Emergency Action Plan, which was placed under Action Plan. Um, we had two types of services added, one both related to the pandemic, um, intubation and we and COVID-19. Um, there was some discussion about, about how to model that and we'll just, we'll hear that in a minute, but we had four additional subject matter domains added during this period as well. Therapeutic apheresis, solid organ transplant, bone marrow transplant and medical aid in dying. Um, so just a few, just a few notes uh, about decisions that we made uh, based on subcommittee dis uh, discussion. Um, there was an ongoing discussion about merging of the H&P notes and the evaluation notes. This is kind of a tough area. Um, there are some diff differing views on the use of those um, names, valuation versus H&Ps. Some users think that they're really the same thing. Um, others really want things labeled evaluation notes distinctly from H&P. Um, there was, you know, yet H&P is, is a word that's actually worked into guidelines. So maybe we can't really choose one over the other. So this decision was made for now to leave them both, but to move the H&P tree under the evaluation tree after some, some discussion about how to do that. So uh, that move was made and now the H&P tree falls under evaluation. Um, the subject matter, as we said, bone marrow transplant was created as a subclass of pediatric hemonc and hematology. Um, the solid organ transplant node was created and there was some discussion regarding where it goes in the hierarchy. And, you know, since we have a multiple hierarchy, we can put it in multiple places. And given that uh, there was the question of distinguishing those who do the surgery, those who care for the patient before and after the surgery, that this kind of could be covering those various issues and it was placed in multi-specialty transplant and internal medicine. So therapeutic apheresis was added as a subject matter domain under nephrology to support the creation of the dialysis and therapeutic apheresis notes. Um, therapeutic apheresis for the time being was also placed as a subclass of blood banking and transfusion medicine, the department that sometimes performs uh, the procedure. Um, in certain institutions. Uh, getting to the pandemic documents, SARS-CoV-2 uh, document terms, um, the decision was made to add COVID-19, sorry, as a type of uh, service. Um, you know, there was some discussion and concern that, well, should we just make a general term for pandemic as, you know, as a type of service or, but, and that uh, perhaps COVID-19 terms wouldn't be useful after the pandemic. However, given the fact that COVID specific forms were being created at certain institutions, the decision was made to create COVID specific as a quick way to pull LOINC related COVID-19 topics. Um, intubation as was created also as a type of service under procedure as part of the submission from CHI to, to add the terms for the pandemic. Um, and, and medical aid in dying was created as a subclass of the multi-specialty program to support the creation of a series of eight notes uh, for that type, for that subject matter with uh, varying 
uh, types of services. So that's kind of a summary of what we've done in the past period. Um, ongoing and future work uh, would in involve uh, reviewing, continue to review and, and undeprecate evaluation notes um, as requested, continual requests for new codes and continual distribution of the OWL file format and maybe eventual evaluation of, of, of a sort of an, uh, a format that might be a little bit more uh, useful to the general um, to general users, uh, sort of like a transit of closure document that uh, re reflects the hierarchies. So that's the, the summary of document ontology and I'll end it there and take any questions anyone might have. There currently are no questions. Uh, no comments. So, um, actually, I'm looking for my raised hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you don't have to raise your hand, Ted. You just speak. Oh well, I you know I don't like interrupting. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, I, I know um, uh, uh, the LOINT codes and most of the um, the content um, uh, can be exported and is available as uh, fire resources for the API and for loads into downloads and installs into um, uh, FHIR terminology services. Um, does this include um, the document ontology definitions and content as well? Because I'd be really, really interested to see how those are, are captured in uh, uh, code system value set resources and concept maps. Uh, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give the best answer I can. Um, the, uh, the values should be available as, as they are long parts um, uh, and can be, you know, pulled as long, as long parts can. Um, the, I know that the mapping of long parts, right now the document ontology parts are not mapped um, to related um, entities and, and the actual hierarchical representation is not, computable from that. The only available computable version is in the OWL file of the, of the hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. Mm -hmm. I was so, uh, playing with conversion of OWL into fire resources and I got all snarled up. Well, Sorry, and this is Fatima. Can I add two little things? Mm -hmm. um, so we actually have all of the document ontology codes available as a value set through our fire terminology services. So just the list of codes that are in the document ontology. And then the other thing that we have implemented is that uh, we have a bunch of specialized properties, um, including the document ontology parts. And so if you actually do a code system lookup for a term that's in the document ontology, you'll get back all of the um, document ontology, you know, subject matter, domain, type of service, et cetera, all of those. So those model those properties in the code yep. system. Excellent. Correct. Excellent. Thank you. That's what I wanted to do. Great. And Thank you. This is Jamie. We also have uh, several link groups, so groupings of the document ontology yep. that are um, as represented as value sets. Okay, outstanding, thank you. And all of that information is on our loink.org slash fire page. So you can go there and play around. <laughs> so this is, this is Rob. I, I just, you know, I, I agree with kind of where Ted is going and I know that, that as a, an organization and as a committee that Link has been focusing on trying to make this stuff more and more, I think, available. And I want to highlight that as, you know, the, the, this is useful information. I mean, we spent a lot of time putting it together. It means something to the folks who have asked us to put it in. And um, most often it's about finding like things which is exactly what we have to do for value sets. And so understanding that there's some, that Link makes some of that stuff available, um, you know, the, the, where we need to go is to be able to make it so that anybody can make a subset that aligns. And that was why we, we were looking at the improved um, uh, uh, search capabilities. Um, you know, I had asked about groups in the context of hierarchy and things like that. So. So one, I think we need to acknowledge that all of the hard work that's been put into this is being 
con is considered valuable and we need to bring it together into one kind of uniform approach so that folks, uh, particularly, you know, I don't want to say that it's always about fire, but, um, but I would say um, if we target making fire uh, the usefulness of the various attributes of the concepts that we have in LOINC, available for fire value set creation and identification, we're going to really enha <clears throat> enhance the usability of all this instead of, and I know, like, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that we've ignored this, but, you know, it's good that these are no longer just separate files that have to be somehow kind of massaged into the process. We need to think of this as one uniform code system, which leads me to my kind of other just um, desire. We talked a little bit about this uh, previously this week. Um, I think, again, the search gives us an indication of the value of this. And I think we need to think of the, the reasons that we put things in the document ontology, the reasons that we put things into groups, uh, the use of our parts and the use of the link parts and things like that. Um, they, they all need to fit together into one uniform whole inside of LOINC so that we can make clear to people, use a link part to do this, use a panel to do this, use a, you know, a group to do this and use the hierarchy for this. And, um, and all of those then need to be available kind of in one place so that we can um, encourage people to, to use that to subset things appropriately and find things. So I think what, you know, all I'm saying is, is that I, I would encourage us to kind of leap and make a one big unified structure and um, and think through why we have these different pieces and make sure they don't overlap or conflict. Yep. Yeah. Good point. So, David, this is Dan. I might hey, make one or two other comments. One is, um, so you, I mean, the, I think we're not as far off as maybe you think, <laughs> Rob, but there's a lot of work to do, but uh, so the great thing is, you know, you precisely can use those document ontology attributes to build value sets and anybody using happy can sort of do that automatically once they load it in the one trick or the the piece that's not there is the hierarchical relationships that are uh, accessible today via happy would be the multi-axial hierarchy which is not the complete set of relationships as defined in the document ontology and so some additional work to define those relationships um, uh, notwithstanding um, it's, it's quite fantastic and pretty, pretty simple to do that. And I guess my characterization has always been that groups effectively are predefined value sets that the LOINC team and the LOINC community feel like are valuable and worth publishing. But at the end of the day, they're value sets and you can make your own ones that collect things in various ways. And that's what having these attributes um, expressed as uh, properties in the code system let, let, uh, let you do. So I continue to be um, excited and enthusiastic about, about this. I, I, I like the direction, Rob, that you're painting, um, but just want to point out that we're, there's substantial functionality already, um, already available there. Yeah. Just as a, a further advertisement for, for members, this, this is one of the most challenging areas of of LOINC in a, in a lot of ways because there's so it, it's it's on the boundary between human language descriptions of things and and our ability to codify and classify them, and so we have we have really interesting discussions. So if you sort of have a a philosophical bias, uh, you know, or uh, if you're a little bit obsessive compulsive about classifications, that sort of thing, I think. Uh, you would enjoy and probably contribute to to this subgroup. So, uh, d yeah, just uh, further advertisement for those who who may be interested or who may want to be a co-chair for for this uh, this work. Okay, thank you, Sam. Can I uh, make a comment? Uh, this is Anna Sharfman from the FDA. Uh, First of all, thank you for all the wonderful work that you are doing. Um, I, am, I am a bit of a contrarian. 
because I'm, I'm working with the data and I have been working with the data for, um, you know, maybe 40 years. I am a board certified clinical pathologist and now a fellow of AMIA, you know, I'm board certified in clinical informatics. And I'm trying to help you succeed. This is the goal. I was just talking now uh, with uh, Jack Bloom, who created way back the concept of central labs. He, he was uh, the one that helped create the uh, Covans. And one thing to start, and I talked already with Stan uh, in the past, that we cannot apply, and also with Andrea, uh, that we cannot apply uh, HL7 and uh, fire and lowing at midstream because this will lead to medical errors. Uh, and I have suffered these medical errors personally when my hus dear husband, companion of over 50 years, died from multiple medical errors due to problems with the data. Then I am personally um, sorry for discretion. But Jack Bloom said, we need to start working with central labs that they are using lowing. Um, and then look how much in agreement the different central labs are. Let's start there. And I try to understand when there is disagreement to try to understand why. And also we have a huge problem in our hands, the diagnostic test now, <clears throat> that we need to understand the proficiency, what is <clears throat> by lot, because we have a shortage of supplies and reagents, then they are being replaced. And <clears throat> we don't know what the positive test is, what the negative test is, <coughs> My husband worked for WHO and PAHO. And I, you know, just because I was the spouse, I have this serving dinner. I learned about uh, huge public health issues. Then we have a huge problem now that uh, it's not enough to have a, a law in code for a diagnostic test. We need to understand exactly which version of each diagnostic test we are using. Then this is uh, my two cents of advice. And thank you for all the work that you are doing. I hope uh, to, to be able to help you more. Uh, and um, I think that we need to, the, the most pressing need now is the most pressing need is to understand the, um, the predictive values of the over 850 uh, different COVID-19 testing news worldwide and with multiple versions of each test. And we have no way of differentiating you know, what everybody's doing. And then we cannot understand what a predictive, a, a positive test means, what a negative test means, and so on. When the regions change with vaccines, we have a system, we learn quickly that we needed to have information by lot. But anyway, you know, I'm removing my hat, the hat that I'm not wearing in yeah. all respect for the work that you are doing. I cannot tell you how much I admire you and how difficult is the problem that you are tackling. Um, Jack thinks that starting to compare law in codes as, as they being used in practice by central labs can help clarify the issues. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Well, that's a, uh, thank you so much for your comment. Uh, the, it, 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 you know, the, this is clinical like, but, but that your, your comments, I'm sure actually have some pertinence to clinical, uh, 
data as well as lab data and, and to COVID testing. And uh, the, the versioning and other things are, are, are interesting because Loink anticipates, uh, you know, the creating different codes and being able to distinguish the lab tests by different methodologies or different analytes or different, um, yeah, different processes. Uh, but, you know, there are things that get to be, as you point out, you know, versioning and lot numbers of, of reagents and other things that are not just, uh, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be solved by making more LOINT codes. It, it really needs structural additions, if you will, to, um, the fire resources, or if you're using version two, you know, additional elements in uh, as part of can, the message. Cannot be done at midstream. Cannot be done only to exchange data because it's already, we don't have that information collected. Right. And, and guessing is not the solution. You know, I am seeing all the problems um, it's painful for me to see uh, all the deaths uh, worldwide. It's really very painful for me. Yeah. And I am sure that it's also painful for every one of you. Uh, then uh, we need to be uh, realistic. And, um, and uh, you know, here, I am here to help you out. And, uh, then thank you again. Thank you. Actually, um, this is Ted. Um, I, I keep thinking that one of the places that we may see a demand for in clinical link next year, um, because people are starting to think about it, um, is to look at um, uh, the kind of information we typically capture in clinical link in terms of behaviors, lifestyles, other kind of clinical observations, especially those things um, that people are struggling to try to find correlations to see what kind of um, uh, personal behaviors are um, effective at reducing infection rates um, or reducing severity if you are infected. Um, uh, everything from uh, fluid intakes, uh, food intakes, types of nutrition, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, things, things as obscure as, uh, you know, what, what temperature you keep the thermostat at your house at, um, all of these kind of other types of information that we typically haven't thought of as clinical data in the past. But um, people are starting to look at it in research projects uh, to try to explain um, some of the mysteries we see um, of, um, of infection rates and, um, and courses of the disease in communities um, are different from what was pre predicted um, based on what we know. And uh, so I, I fully expect there to be an increase in um, desires for codes for this kind of observational information uh, sometime next year. And um, you know, I've been thinking about um, how um, how the relationships architecturally inside the terminology should be set up um, for this kind of information. I'm involved in some um, uh, lifestyle informatics work being done in Korea right now, and um, and so all of this kind of ties into all of that um, uh, because uh, people are still struggling to find out um, what are all of the things that we don't yet know that are affecting our, our difficulty in, in getting a handle on controlling this pandemic. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, there is a comment, not a question. SCT has situation codes to capture other such information. Thank you, Dr. Susan. Um, do we want to move on to the next 
uh, topic, David? Uh, sure, um, I can do that. Uh, let me start sharing again. I think the next one is mine too, so I'll... Yes. Okay, um, so this topic is a topic that was going to be a, a was and sort of became a will be. And what I mean by that is that the comments were originally uh, due to ONC on the um, proposed comments reg regarding the US CDI um, October 9th. And, I th and my understanding is that was extended to October 23rd and our conference is sitting right in the middle. So um, this provides the opportunity to take these proposals from the document ontology subcommittee and possibly open them for, you know, further comments by this group. Um, if, if we agree that that's the thing to do. David, are you sharing? Uh, I thought I was, but I will. Yes, I didn't push the last button. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks, April. Um, okay, so these are, this is basically an overview of our, our uh, document ontology subcommittee proposal to ONC for uh, USCDI. Now, I'd like to point out um, at the outset, I don't know, why is this not dancing? There we go. That um, we are making this proposal in the context of um, what is currently in version one of USCDI for things like data classes and data elements. Um, and, you know, the existing understanding of those things. So this proposal is made in that context, uh, just to kind of clarify that. Um, and, you know, USCDI, just to kind of define it, it's a standardized set of health data classes and constituent data elements for nationwide interoperable health, interoperable health information exchange. So the view that I guess we have of data class right now is that it's an aggregation of data elements and data element is a granular, some granular level at which data is represented. Um, that's a little, it may be a little fuzzy. So I think there, you know, we'll have a follow-up discussion. I think Dan's gonna you know, uh, get into some more global issues regarding that after this. So the um, clinical note data class is really what we're focusing on here in this proposal. And if we look at the current, well, let's look at all this, a summary of all the data classes. You can see clinical notes are here and the constituent data elements that are currently in version one associated with clinical notes are listed here. And this sort of gives you a bigger picture of the, of the whole thing right now. Um, if we focus in on the clinical notes and look at this document from July of 2020, which has a page covering the clinical notes and the data elements and their descriptions. There are a few issues that we wished to address in our proposal. Uh, one issue to note is, I'm just moving the, all these faces out of my way, sorry. Uh, one issue to note is that each data element maps to a single, or at least is listed at, for applicable standards, a single a uh, link term that is sort of the most general term in that area. Um, instead of mapping to the more, um, you know, a list uh, basically of link terms, there are many consultation notes in link that vary by, you know, uh, subject matter that vary by um, setting. And this is just the most general consult note. Um, and this is missing the information about how to get to that set of notes. So that is issue number one. Um, uh, issue number two is that not all note types are represented. Um, you know, we have console, discharge summary, H&P, procedure in progress, but there's other things like transfer notes, um, care plans, excuse me, where do outpatient notes fit into this, you know, there are some questions as to the set that they've chosen and their clinical notes are kind of the first three are up here and the second two are down here and there's five and sitting in the middle because this is sort of just by it looks to be alphabetical are these 
uh, three narratives. And the third issue is that it's not really clear what the intention of these three narratives are and whether they really belong uh, under clinical notes. I mean, it says something like contains a consulting specialist's interpretation of the laboratory report. But what is that? Where do you see that? Is that a separate document that, you know, that somebody writes or is it just part of the report? You know, it's not really clear uh, what is what that is defining. So the proposal for um, issue one, and I, I guess I should have brought up the actual documents and unfortunately I don't sort of neglected to have them ready. So I um, apologize for that. But the um, proposal that we have is, is in three word documents that should be uploaded to the, you know, the handouts for this session. So please review those. Uh, you can download them and review them. Um, and there is the first uh, one, uh, first word document is um, sort of a summary that says, well, first let's explain what we're doing here. Let's include something up here saying um, that long document codes represent expected collections of information. Um, and for each note type, there's a generic concept, but there's also more specific concepts that vary by setting specialty. And we're gonna encourage the use of the more specific code uh, in most clinical situations. Um, we're also saying that this column should include the generic code plus also include links to value sets of the more specific codes. And, you know, it was also suggested um, by one of the committee that what we're, what we're calling applicable standards, you know, that's sort of like a global term that, you know, standards don't only mean terminology. So maybe we, we should be saying that these are applicable terminology standards. And I, I think that's well taken. Uh, that probably should be, uh, should be uh, reflected in that column header. And, you know, the third part of this proposal is that the Regan Street team can provide the Loink Fire value sets with associated um, OIDs. We can also provide web pages with downloadable content for each note type. So the links actually can be um, sort of Loink hosted. Um, rather than relegating to value set repositories. And, and I think this, what we're suggesting here is that, you know, they would be updated automatically every time a link release is made instead of having to require a secondary process to upload those somewhere, somewhere else. So just to kind of give you a sense, this is what we're, this is what the first three, three uh, clinical note types look like now. And this is what we're suggesting they could look like um, with the generic note plus a link, you know, a future link. These are, you know, obviously not live links yet. We haven't built these yet, but to a value set, fire, you know, fire value set um, and a web page enabled with a CSV download um, of a list. So that is the proposal for part one um, to go from a single to links to value sets. The issue two proposal is to add clinical note data elements um, for consideration in US 2 di version two of these five, which kind of were standouts as being missing. And it's understandable that, you know, the first set that are up there, the five that are up there already that are the existing ones are primarily types of service some of these actually start bringing in settings, so you kind of, so you you can see that you're getting overlap. Um, you know, you could potentially have overlap. I mean, you can have a console note that's an outpatient note, but the feeling was that these are largely complementary, and they should be included to better represent, um, you know, just clinical documentation in general. That where we'd be missing a lot if we don't include other note types than the five that they've got up there now. And the issue three proposal is what to do with these narratives that we don't really understand and, and seem to be more procedure, you know, descriptors of procedures 
uh, ordered procedures rather than clinical notes um, would be to remove these rows from the clinical notes data class in the US CDI. Um, but regarding the imaging, to propose a new USC CDI data class imaging uh, with, which has two quote unquote data elements, imaging orders and imaging report. Um, so these are the Word documents. Um, I, su I suppose we could have a quick look at them if there's time uh, or would it be better be go to discussion. Um, and David, this is Swapno. Maybe I'll just yeah, describe. Um, maybe I'll just describe what the documents are, and then we sure, can have sure. some discussion. And so there's three documents. Uh, the first one basically describes what we're recommending for the existing data elements. Because so here's the other confusing part is because there's two things. There's the existing elements that we're commenting on, and then there's new data elements that we're proposing. And so those comments have to be submitted by a two different means. And that's why there's so many different documents. But anyway, so the first is a Word document that summarizes our comments that we would like to submit uh, related to the existing five uh, clinical note types um, in terms of you know, adding the explanatory text and you know, adding uh, information about how to find the additional codes. Okay, and so, then, yeah, so I'm not, I was a, sorry to interrupt, but I, was, I have the document up. Oh, excellent. Okay, so yeah, so that's what that one is. And then the other two are actually uh, copies of the on deck uh, prep sheet for the new data elements. One is for the additional uh, node types that we were going to suggest adding. Um, right, and then, yeah, and then the other one is for the imaging. Uh, document codes. And the reason I posted these or I put these together is just because there's a lot of information on here and I wanted to make sure that, you know, everybody agreed with every, you know, not just at high level, but sort of with the details of all the check boxes and everything else. Um, I'll mention too that uh, Tim, our team member Tim, has uploaded the draft submission for USCDI that David mentioned to our website and you can download it from there. The link is in the chat box for everyone to see. Okay, thank you. Okay, so are there any, um, am, I, am I live here? Are there any other um, uh, questions or comments on this proposal? David, this is Andrea. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes, I, 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 I put a comment. I'm glad you mentioned this because when I saw USCDI CDI come out and I saw these narratives from lab and path report, I was wondering if lunt codes were going to be created for them, um, similar to the other documents in the ontology. I didn't interpret this as that these are lab and path reports, but rather physician summaries after they've read or assessed those reports you know, in the clinical notes on the EHR side, it's unclear too if it includes genetics reports, you know, as a genetic counselor might be consulting or interpreting um, different um, whole genome sequencing. I don't know, Jamie, if, if you know any more about this too, but um, it seems like this is more on the EHR side, but you're right. It, I mean, it seems like that there's some partial information here and, and right. some gaps that need to be filled and clarified. So Andrea, actually, so we spoke to ONC um, about what the lab and path and imaging, what those uh, data elements are supposed to represent. And they actually, I guess their intention was that those three things represent the narrative part of the lab report, um, you know, or the path report or the imaging report. So it's not sort of like another consultant's interpretation or the, you know, provider's interpretation of what's in those results, but it's actually the narrative from the report itself. And so yeah. that whole area is a little bit confusing and that's why we didn't, you know, okay. put in comments. Yeah. About that. No, no, that, that's good. It's not a separate clinical note per se, you know, that's why it's, right. it's confusing, yeah. Well, and the interesting thing too is why is it under, you know, kind of the lab results piece um, mm -hmm. under that USCDI element and over here under the clinical notes because it is kind of get a little confusing. But the, the other aspect too is um, 
did they clarify if they're assuming this is like a PDF? Because some lab reports, if they're structured data and they're encoded with blank and SNMED um, or other terminologies as appropriate, um, may have a totally different structure, more like the, the lab test results side of the USCDI versus this approach. Yeah, and one of the things that we want to add, I guess, David, if you could go back to that first Word document, is some clarifying language um, that basically says, um, yeah, that one, that basically says that the document codes represent the expected collections of information, regardless of whether it's structured or unstructured or electronic or PDF or whatever. Like it's basically, you know, the, the notes, the note codes represent the information that's expected to be in there, regardless of the format. And that language actually, I think, was present at one point, like an early draft, and then was removed. So it's, you know, it's not clear why that is. Um, but we wanted to clarify that as well. And we actually, we were going to propose something related to the lab comments. And sorry, I'm just trying to pull that up uh, right now. And we hadn't included it in this presentation because this is the clinical committee. Um, yeah, and thanks for clarifying what the clinical group has been doing. Yeah, so I'm just looking up. Oh, so for lab, we were going to re uh, recommend adding um, type one lab terms under like so on the lab page, adding another row for data element um, for Sorry, I'm just trying to read my own notes here. Yeah, um, I think I think it's a type <laughs> one. Yeah, just like restricting to type to um, type one. Yeah, type one. Right? Oh, right, right. So for the right for the lab test, you know, codes themselves restricting type one, and then um, also adding um, information about uh, some NCT for qualitative results and UCOM units uh, to accompany quantitative results for the values and results row. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right, because some of those are, are gaps in the USCDI. The other thing in kind of reading this over about the fire aspect, kind of like my comments yesterday, ONC, fire isn't mature for clinical lab yet from the sense of ONO is still trying to work on the diagnostic report and the structure, which seems like it'd be very much aligned with this um, in fire um, to make sure that all the required CLIA data elements are met, et cetera. Um, I have no idea when that may be ready. Um, I know that they're working towards it. It's just, um, and it's very early. And we're trying to get real world clinical data. Um, JD Nolan is one of the co-chairs has provided a bone marrow biopsy report to try to get that model. But I don't think work has started on that. So I have, I have concerns from the laboratory community that, you know, if this is part of the USCDA requirements, that it may not be implementable and CLIA regulatory compliant, which could, and, and with other regulatory agencies that might have even more restrictive requirements that might be in these reports. So I think this might be a challenge. And from our side, we were simply, um, you know, we were just gonna provide a fire value set that contains all of those clinical note codes. So that, you know, that's just sort of from the terminology services side of things. Um, but there's also a, uh, there's a comment uh, in the Q&A, so, or maybe a question. If the narratives would be recommended to be removed, how do we ensure that organizations would share not just the quantitative results, but also the narrative comments? Currently, many places only show to patients the quantitative aspect, and the most important part of the result, maybe the narrative. Um, and that's a great point. And I guess we're not, you know, we're not suggesting that people don't report the narrative. We just don't think that the lab and clinical, or sorry, not clinical, the lab and pathology and imaging narrative is a clinical note. So clinical note means something a little bit different. I absolutely think that the narrative on all those reports needs to be, you know, or for all the lab results and everything needs to be reported. Um, but it's just confusing to have it on the clinical notes page because those aren't really clinical notes. It's the narrative from the lab report. The report, yeah. So they'll be there, they'll just be elsewhere, yeah. Yep. I was gonna make a couple of quick comments. I know we're just about out of time. I wanna speak in favor of the idea of linking the specific note types to value sets. I think that's sort of like a no brainer. I also have never <clears throat> understood what the 
those narrative words, and I hope they just remove them. I did want to ask um, for a little clarity around the imaging uh, order and result piece and the idea of proposing different um, data elements for those. Um, but before that, I would be interested in hearing a summary of the take on the value of adding additional subtypes to those clinical notes, um, sort of why those few that we chose and versus and or sort of allowing the sort of full uh, variation uh, expressed in the rest of the ontology um, as a more general sort of uh, data class um, and sort of the pros and cons or, or, you know, why you decided to go with just adding like these five as opposed to 10 as opposed to a more generic class that would sort of encompass all of the variation? That's a good question, Dan. I, you know, I, when, you, when you think about it, you, you know, we came at this from looking at, well, there are these five and they're missing something, so let's add some more. Um, not so much as remodeling their, um, you know, their structure at this point, but, you know, I think you make a good point because even adding these five, we're not including every clinical note. Um, so, yeah, and I guess if I could add, so, right, I agree, like we weren't thinking of it in terms of sort of re, you know, sort of redoing what they're specifying, but we we're just thinking, oh, we'll just, you know, recommend adding more rows to the table. But I guess I was just thinking from a clinical perspective, you know, trying to think of what the most important note types that are missing are, and then also just looking at Loink and seeing where we have the most representation, um, just because I think that does reflect, um, you know, what notes the community is using because they're all requested by the community and so these are the five or so that have you know that have the most representation other than the ones that are already in uh the us cdi and so that was the thinking behind that but i agree i think it would be you know saying something about well there's a whole rest of document ontology also with lots of other note types um i think that would also be valuable to add Um, and so I realize that we're out of time. And so Dan, we're going to go ahead and start with you uh, right at one o'clock. But I do want to point out again that the um, that the proposals are posted on the uh, conference page on the clinical committee meeting uh, page right now. And so if you do have feedback, if you could provide that by next uh, Wednesday at the latest, since um, I'll have to submit everything by Friday or on Friday, I guess. Right, and the information of, you know, just our e the email to use is in the um, last page, the last slide. All right, so thank you. Okay. So I guess we'll break now and then come back uh, in an hour. Hey, sounds That's good. Okay. Thanks, hey. all. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Talk to you thank shortly. You. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye. Uh, welcome officially to the last session of our LOINC conference. We are happy to have everybody that's here today, whether you're joining for the first time or if you have been with us the entire week, we welcome you back. It's been a wonderful, wonderful week of learning, engaging, and uh, quite some entertaining as well. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Ted Klein, who is going to run this afternoon session. Ted? Oh, good day, everyone. Um, uh, welcome. and. Uh, Thanks for hanging in there um, through uh, the, uh, the week of LOINC sessions, all of which have been absolutely wonderful as always. Um, so uh, the, uh, this, uh, this afternoon, we're going to uh, finish uh, the last of our uh, sessions in clinical LOINC. And we're gonna start off with a presentation um, from Dan Vreeman. Um, those of us who've been involved with LOINC um, uh, before or for a very long time, uh, are quite familiar with uh, with Dan and his excellent work and uh, excellence all around and everything. And I'll turn it over to him for uh, his presentation. Um, Dan, take it away. Great, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Well, I hope you all had a refill on coffee, regardless of what time of day it is. You need some white coffee like this because uh, we're gonna have some fun with the, the USCDI again. Um, let me go ahead and bring up my slides here. All right. So I'm going to walk through some ideas um, 
about how to better improve or some recommendations I've been ruminating about for um, having more precise modeling of the entities in the US CDI. So we spent some time in our last session um, reviewing and kind of covering some basics so I can skip through some of this. But I wanna start by saying that my thinking on this is informed by the experiences that we've had at LOINC, understanding um, kind of request processes and thinking ahead about how to um, make the USCDI an even stronger foundation. Now, uh, we're gonna cover, I'm gonna just sort of touch on a few of the high points and uh, I'd love to encourage you to dig into a little bit more detail. I had hoped that this would have maybe gone out with some uh, chance for you to review and read ahead of time. Um, and whether that's true or not, um, it's all right. You can certainly circle back. Um, these slides and the link to this or the actual document will be posted for sure. Um, but uh, they're available now on, uh, on the website. But I really had three main goals for bringing this up today. One is for the LOINC community, just to illustrate how crucial LOINC is to underpinning the, the USCDI. But I'd really love to get some feedback on a proposal that's um, intended to help strengthen USCDI's foundation for future growth. Um, we're kind of in the phase now where this is the first open call for proposals to the USCDI. And just sort of with the ear to the ground and what's happening in the community, there's a lot of activity. And I feel like this is a really important moment to help set the foundation for how this evolves over time, including USCDI's use and reference of like. Um, and then my third goal is maybe to help frame and refine how you as part of the one community who are potentially working on projects or in HL7 or other communities that may be making proposals for expanding uh, the USCDI. So to how to think uh, about and maybe refine your thinking uh, slightly. So I'm not gonna re recap this because uh, David uh, covered it. Y'all know what the USCDI is. Um, it represents a really important set of uh, clinical information that's becoming very widely available, both by uh, providers and by payers via um, regulations that uh, ONC, CMS have, have promulgated, as well as being encouraged by NIH for use in clinical research contexts. And as you recall, USCDI in its current form has really two kinds of entities. And so I'm using entities as a generic word to cover these two things and potentially more in the future data classes, which are aggregations of data elements for some purpose or use case. And data elements have this interesting definition of being the most granular level at which a piece of data is exchanged. Um, I think we could maybe uh, help the community by adding a little bit of precision to how we think about these entities. So as you recall from David's slide, this is sort of the current state of the world. Uh, what's in bold are the data classes that are there. What's listed below them uh, in regular typeface are the data elements. And if you've explored or dug into this, you'll um, you recognize that there are different, I don't know, different levels of granularity, different kinds of things sort of happening across these uh, uh, entities, these classes and data elements. So as I've been thinking about this, again, informed by our experiences with LOINC, I think we have some opportunities to clarify. In part, some of the issues that I've noticed is, you know, challenges with understanding, well, what the heck is the difference between these two things? Uh, why are some data classes basically the same thing as the data elements? So if I jump back here, you'll notice like health concerns and health concerns, immunizations and immunizations, problems and problems, procedures and procedures, smoking status, smoking status, medications, medications. They seem to be like all this, not all, but some of them seem to be identical. So what, what's going on there? And in addition, some data elements uh, that you might think of as variables, like I would call like body height or um, you know, a smoking status a categorization or heart rate, you know, those to me, you might use the word variable for those. Some of those are data elements, but in other areas, like for lab tests, the elements are like attributes. It's like the lab test name or the lab test value. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of consistency in how those things are expressed. And in part, I kind of go back to, well, what, what's meant by a class? And you know, in sort of computer programming, uh, you think of a class as a template uh, and all the instances of that class inherit the definitions and the attributes, et cetera. 
but really in this context, um, ONC is using it more just as sort of a collection, a group org, which is, which is okay too, but I think um, it's worth sort of clarifying some of these. Further, as uh, was illustrated by the comments that the documentology community came up with, there's pretty loose connections to vocabularies. Um, sometimes they're sort of expressed as a you know, related standard at the whole code system level. Um, but there are also pretty loose connections to data models or the prevailing mechanisms that people uh, exchange or represent clinical information. And while USCDI is intended to be data standard um, agnostic, meaning it should sort of work equally well if you're using CDA or document-based exchange or FHIR API-based exchange, et cetera, the important point that I want to sort of have you think about is this idea of without knowing what shape the data has, and I'm using shape sort of here as a generic construct for what does the resource look like? What does the table in a common data model look like? Without knowing that shape, it's actually impossible to really figure out correctly how to use the vocabularies because you don't know if a LOINT code is, is appropriate for use in a particular slot or attribute of this thing, unless you actually know the whole shape because you can't use panel codes in certain contexts and you can't use SNOMED CT codes in certain contexts and you might want to be able to use CPT codes in some ways, but maybe not in other slots. So not understanding or having a clear connection to that shape makes it really hard to be precise about uh, and correct in using vocabulary standards. Um, and so my takeaway on this is that I, I feel like this, I'm gonna use the word haphazard. Um, that's sort of a you know, tongue in cheek sort of way. The haphazard uh, structure or organization, I feel like could be improved by building on the huge amounts of work that have gone into thinking about organization of uh, health data by the fire community and by the various communities um, that have developed CDMs, uh, who put a lot of work into uh, thinking about these uh, overall structures. And as one sort of uh, you know example here to sort of think about, you know, there's a there's a data class in USCDI today. It's called assessment, and then it also says implant of treatment. And as you look at that, you're like, well, what is, what really is that? Is that the A and P part of the note? Is it, um, you know, an activity performed like an, like a, a clinical scale or something? Is it a, is it a condition? What, what really is this? And by having a tighter linkage to the data shape, we would have a much more clear sense of, oh, when you're saying assessment, you actually mean like a diagnostic process. Or do you actually mean this is a clinical observation or a scale, et cetera? So here's an example, I think, of, um, that we can sort of use to, to think about too. Here is uh, the smoking status uh, data class. And well, it's also the data element. Um, and you know, this particular one doesn't reference LINK uh, in the US, current USCBI definition. Now, if you look at the fire, uh, US core implementation of this, you'll notice that FHIRE and the community that developed a spec around that decided to represent this as an observation and they bound it to a particular LOINT code and then these SNOMED codes were the allowed or preferred or required uh, answer choice for that. But when we come to USCDI, we don't really have any of that context. And so to sort of say, well, is SNOMED appropriate? Well, what about other vocabularies? We don't understand exactly how um, this is intended to be, be set up without some of that, um, without some of that structure. So um, I wanted to then sort of transition to thinking about how does this play out in the future? And to do that, you know, I just pulled a, a screenshot of a couple of the comments that have come into the USCDI today. And um, there are a number of things that are still coming. The submission was pushed back, so people are gearing up and going uh, to make their comments, et cetera. But just as a quick example, you'll notice two, two of these comments here on, that are on the main page talk about flagging uh, a particular uh, field, at a fire element, as being required or preferred, in this case, uh, related to allergy intolerances. Um, and wanting to sort of bump up the, the uh, status there to being something as required as opposed to preferred. And then the second comment there is about, um, you know, he's referencing some 
proposals around ophthalmic data, uh, intraocular pressure as a variable, et cetera, and suggesting you know, that what we should have is uh, the date that a diabetic um, eye exam uh, was performed. And I bring these comments up to show that as this plays out in the future, there are gonna be lots of very, very specific requests or asks. Um, these are pretty particular uh, uh, kinds of, of comments and whether they get added or represented in USCDI, we'll, we'll see. Um, but I think we should uh, consider how the structure might support making different kinds of statements. So I wanna be clear, I'm not trying to push for having every single loin code represented as something in the USCDI or even lots and lots or thousands of them. I don't think that that would necessarily be helpful. I'm not arguing for exploding the number of things in the USCDI, but I wanted to consider what if by way of regulation or some other uh, activity, um, people wanted to make statements uh, such as every health system, health IT system should be able to send, for example, if they have, if your system has this kind of data, all clinical measurement results. How would that be expressed in USCDI? What if you wanted to say uh, that every system should be able to send the code identifier, result value, units of measure, reference range, relevant physiologic relevant time, uh, observed specimen or whatever, when you send a clinical measurement result? Or what if you wanted to say something you know, about, say, sending all results for the subset of clinical measurements known as vital signs or some other subset that you deemed as being important? Or what if you wanted to drill down to the level of saying every health IT system should be able to send a heart rate, which is in my view sort of a specific variable, but yet that variable might actually have several allowable uh, or perfectly valid uh, link code representations that could be used. How might U USCDI be able to make statements that have this kind of precision without going uh, sort of overboard. That was sort of the collection of ideas that brought me to sort of write up something and think through um, how they might do this. And so again, the, uh, the, the full proposal link has um, a lot more detail, but I wanted to start by kind of reorienting our thinking about data elements. And you know, I don't want to go too crazy with this, but in, in the ISO standard and the way in which elements are used in, in FHIR, um, you know, it's, it's helpful to think about them in that context, or it's similar to how a, a particular field in a table of a common data model like Odyssey or OMOP or uh, PCORnet would be. And so a data element in this context has a couple of things. It's got a definition, a label, and it sort of enumerates the set of permissible values. Now that set of permissible values can be expressed in a bunch of different ways, might include things like data type, the terminology, or syntactic expressions. If, for example, what's allowed is say an address and you wanna say it's formatted in the particular format like the USPS format, or you're dealing with something like HDVSS, that's uh, HDVS, which is like a syntax. But in this context, these kinds of data elements are typically not used on their own, right? They're, they're typically part of a larger structure and, and, and that's what I would call sort of a data class. And so, when you think of something like an address, it doesn't really make sense in healthcare sort of on its own. It's typically part of another structure. So we can say something about a facility address versus a patient address. And the same thing with all these different dates and times, right? They have some context to them. So this is sort of the thinking of uh, that I, I think it's helpful to use this model of data element as opposed to a data element is a variable or it's akin to a link code. Um, and the reason being, we would then be focused on sort of the essential data elements that we would assemble together to have a data class definition. And so that brings me to sort of what, is, what, a, what would a, a slightly refined idea of a data class be? Well, data class could be a composite structure of enumerated data elements. The idea is we don't necessarily want to or need to be exhaustive about this. We just want to identify the couple or the few or whatever that's important for defining that class, for defining that data shape, which would serve as a sort of template for how instances would be stored uh, or exchanged. So in this way, it's, it's conceptually identical to what you might think of as a fire resource or a CDM data table. It's just that we don't need to do all of that. We just sort of need to be able to say, well, here are the three or the four or the five or, or whatever key things that we want. So to sort of reformat or rethink about 
some of the things that are in USCDI, you might think about, okay, patient demographics could be, or the sort of patient kind of a thing could be a data class. And every instance there that we're talking about would have a couple of key attributes, name, address, date of birth, birth sex, et cetera. But my, my thought here is sort of transforming to um, thinking of these classes as the enumerated list of particular data types uh, and those are of data elements. And then over time, adding more data elements as the community sort of agrees and there's a greater industry alignment, there's more maturity in the implementation, helps us draw that shape a little bit more precisely. Um, it adds additional detail uh, to what we're saying. Whereas by adding data classes, we sort of have a more complete picture of the whole health story. But that brings us to um, sort of how do we represent some of the more um, interesting subsets. Now I've purposefully used the fire terminology of profile here, but the idea is we start by saying we want to define a subtype of a particular data class and therefore it, inher it inherits whatever structural attributes that parent data class might have. So we don't have to sort of uh, reinvent all of these things all the time. We could say um, that we're adding additional constraints by way of either adding additional data elements to that parent class or by adding constraints to the original ones that were defined in the class. And so this is basically identical to the sort of fire model of profiling, but I, it's, it's simpler in a, in, in a sense. And I wanted to give a few examples of how I was thinking this could play out. So in, in the current uh, USCDI, the laboratory test results data class would be constructed as sort of a profile on a more broader observation one where we say, hey, the, uh, what is this thing? Well, we give it a human definition, test measurements, observations about a specimen removed from the subject. Hey, that sounds familiar if you know something about lung lab tests. But um, here we would say, okay, how would we define that? Well, we would say that the two key data elements would be, you know, observation.code and observation.value uh, uh, quantity code or, or what have you. And we would apply constraints by saying for this profile, it inherits the observation characteristics, but we're saying that the code has to be drawn from a particular subset. So this is sort of identical to what you heard discussed for the clinical documents in, in David's pro, um, previous proposal. So I think they're very congruent ideas. Similarly, if you really wanted to drill down to a particular variable, such as important um, things like vital signs, such additional detail could be added as well. And so here you would say, okay, I'm making a profile about an observation, but I'm going to narrow that range of allowed uh, observation codes to only the set of codes that, are, uh, that represent systolic blood pressure measurements. But of course, there are more than one. And so we might wanna express this as a value set, but because we've drilled down that far, we might add an additional constraint to say, not just use UCOM, but oh, here is a particular UCOM unit that's appropriate for this particular variable. But because we've adopted this model that has a shape, a particular sort of structure of having an observation code and a value and the units of measure, then we can sort of say those kinds of things without just sort of generically pointing to entire code systems. Um, the last example I think um, here that I can share is just around um, you know mobility functioning and so this is a is an example of something um, in the clinical domain that's been worked on quite a bit in the PASIO project and again we can sort of identify the shape that the stuff might have but drill down at a content level using the terminology aspects and relationships to be able to do that and so I think you can now have some sense of how you might reframe that current um, smoking status uh, uh, data element and data class into something um, that, uh, that has these sort of terminology um, uh, relationships. And um, the last sort of structural thing that might be helpful in some context, this idea of a collection, I, I, I mentioned that um, currently data class is sort of a generic sort of collection of things. Um, in, in my proposal, I was thinking of this as um, really the case for when you wanted to group uh, data classes or data elements or profiles that spanned multiple uh, different uh, classes. So for example, um, uh, medication might encompass multiple different 
a medication collection might en encompass multiple different data classes if you had separate structures for ordering, dispensing, administration, uh, et cetera. Um, this is sort of the, the least, um, the least uh, uh, preeminent sort of thing. But um, the last point I wanted to sort of make is I, I really feel like um, with a current submission process, it'd also be really helpful if ONC can help surface relationships to um, technical specs that they have deemed to have implemented this particular kind of entity. Um, to help people when they go to it, they say, oh, how does this look in CDA? Oh, I could point to that particular thing and say, here we go, or here's this fire profile from US Corps, that is how it implements it. And um, some of that is coming into the submission system now, and I feel like it would just be helpful for, uh, for it to be um, uh, visible to the public. So sorry, I went a little bit longer than I actually anticipated, um, but uh, hopefully there's still a little bit of time for so, kind of discussion yeah. and reaction. This is Susan. Hi, Dan. So good to see you. I love this idea. And that's, you know, part of some of what, and Stan will probably have a lot to say too, that we've been proposing with, with HL7 is that we come up with patterns in fire, you know, for, you know, quantitative lab, ordinal lab, um, surgical procedure versus a bedside procedure uh, that are specific patterns and we have quite a few of those already in CEM, um, right? You know, as our base types, and and I, I how I don't know how we can rally around and help with this, or how we can get uh, go. I'll go out to the document and look at it. But this is this is my favorite presentation of the last month. <laughs> so, thank you. You're welcome. Um, well, I don't, so I guess there might be a couple things and, you know, the, the committee chairs can figure out where they want to go with this. Certainly, ONC is accepting public comments. So anybody who wants to make a public comment and reference this, you know, go for it. Whether there's something more specific Loink would like to do with this, I think is open for consideration. But, um, but I, I think um, the more voices contribute to ONC to say, hey, this is an idea or direction that we should think about, I think the better. Yeah, I I just chip in. I mean, this goes back a long ways. Uh, <laughs> in fact, to the sort of the the initiation of Loink, there was the realization, you know, that um, meaning in in the way that we're thinking about it is is a combination of of codes and and a structure and you know, you're using words data class and other things. Uh, and we, you know, we need to be careful about the vocabulary, but, or, or models, um, you know, structure and models. And, and basically it, the realization was you don't, we didn't know how to make loint codes when we started out, unless we basically had the context of saying, uh, here's a field in the OBX segment where the code goes and here's the field where the value would go and sometimes the value is a coded value and sometimes it's numeric etc uh and uh and i think that's a you know that's a truism i think i you know it's um it's analogous to you know uh human languages where you need sentence structures and you need, need to understand the sentence structure and understand whether this thing is a subject or the object <laughs> in the senates etc in order for it to have a unique and an understandable meaning and so i couldn't agree more it, i think what i see is uh th this is going to be uh probably a long discussion with onc and uh, and those guys because it's not we're not just asking them to add three things to a list we're we're actually you know this would propose that we're going to change sort of how we do this and it's it's been a problem from the start you know because they would say you, you know they would say use use loin codes for for labs and there wasn't a distinction whether you were identifying you know the question or the answer uh you know and so there was confusion and so and, and until you until you specify the structure that's the target of what you're what you're creating the code for uh, you have ambiguity and, and misunderstanding. And so uh, this was a, you know, very good, a very good presentation. Absolutely support it. The other thing that's a, um, 
uh, all I would say is this, this is also a path on, a, on an evolution to where what you really want is a very large library of things that say exactly how you do a blood pressure, exactly how you do a, something else. And this, you know, what you proposed is, is a, I think, a very measured step to the next level of specificity on the way to saying, look, uh, you know, we've, we've got a pattern now for quantitative lab, but this is exactly how we want you to do hematocrits. And this is how we want you to do it with deal with the issue of whether uh, there's a method associated with this or, or, or the method is post-coordinated. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a whole series of issues that you haven't dug into that need to be resolved if you're going to get to really absolute understanding of, of uh, the data that you're exchanging between systems. So this, this Rob, I'll, I'll jump in too. Um, uh, the my my kind of assessment of what you're proposing, and believe me, and I, I'm sure you know this. And I'm sure everybody, most of the panelists are are, are on the same page, and you know we've been frustrated with the kind of lack of specificity in this. And the and I, to me, it sounds like what you're proposing is that the USCDI should be a logical model, um, and and with you know, kind of, you could imagine representing what you just presented as a UML model, i.e., it isn't necessarily fire, but um, but you could certainly make links to fire. You could make links to to various elements of of uh, uh, CDA-based uh, elements. You could make links to um, NCPDP, to IEG, to lots of things, which I think would be really useful and um, and the kind of specificity that is a derivative of the sort of thing that we have from the USCDI. So, so first I just, would you agree with that? Because I got a follow on. Um, yes, I, I do agree with that. And what I guess what I would say is in its current form, USCDI sort of feels like it's kind of halfway there and it's halfway into another undefined space of a million different conceptualizations of what we mean by data element. And right. I sort of hate that phrase, uh, those two words put together because it seems like everybody I talk to has a very slightly different interpretation of what they mean by that. And, and so what I was trying to do was a, a strategic but incremental step towards something a little bit more precise and I but I agree with the premise that effectively what this is saying is we should think of it more as a logical model yeah I, I mean I, I I think some might look at what you're suggesting and believe me I, I again I, I think this is great it, it, it isn't a little step <laughs> from where it is right now um, so so here's here's what I wonder um, you know I don't have any insight actually into whether ONC would be interested in taking what I think is a big step quite honestly in doing this I suspect it's too big a step and yet I also think that it's desperately needed so the real question that I have is how do we create an opportunity for something to fill that gap right um, and, and maybe you're proposing, this is certainly a lot easier for you now that you're not <laughs> at LOINC, um, that LOINC might do that. But um, I think that, that that's the real question um, that you're, in essence, proposing. Because this isn't really a LOINC proposal. This is a forum where you get to kind of say, hey, I think, again, I'll put words in your mouth. Hey, I think we need a logical model for for the US uh, for the US environment in order to get alignment on the specific the specific at the level of specificity necessary to really interoperate. And so I think the question that you're asking is who can do that? You know, if if that is not what US EDI is and right now it's not. So um, uh, and I I'm I, I think I feel pretty confident that the um, that ONC would certainly not only not get in the way of, would be very supportive of some entity filling that gap 
and saying, here's how this lines up with USDI. Now, I agree with you. Part of the problem is, is that USDI is all over the map with regards to granularity and, and meaning and all sorts of stuff. So there's some problems there that if you keep USDI and you try to map what you just proposed, you, you know, you got work on both ends. You got to create the thing that you think is useful and you got to figure out how does it actually align with this thing that quote, people are required to do. So for me, that's the problem. I, you know, I'll just be flat out. I don't think the, I don't think ONC is going to take this proposal and run with it. I mean, I would love to be proven wrong, but I just don't think it's going to happen. So I think the real thing that you're asking is how can we fill this gap? And, and I'd be interested in what people thought with regards to that. Yeah, I would, I would too. Um, and I guess I would also say that uh, there is a sense to which these ideas could be reflected in the kinds of submissions that come in that raise the awareness and impetus that ONC sort of takes to think, oh, maybe this is something we should actually work on. So I do think there's some sort of critical mass as opposed to, or let me say not opposed to, in addition to say more authorities, uh, whether authority in sort of an SDO sense or whatever steps up and sort of says, hey, actually, this is sort of how we think this should be represented. So I think there's at least sort of two dimensions to which we can um, tune ONC's ears to hearing these kinds of things. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and note my bias. I mean, my answer to your question, Rob, is that, you know, this at at the core, this is a lot of what SEMI was trying to do within HL7. Uh, and, and we had some tribulation, <laughs> uh, not so much actually with, with, with the logical model as getting agreement about the formalism to use for this, uh, whether to use simple or clinical element modeling language or o, you know, open EHRs, uh, uh, BMM and ADL uh, or UML, you know, Rob mentioned you, you know, uh, their choice anyway. Uh, but that's one place and the other place is Logica. I mean, this is the heart of, uh, of the modeling work at Logica. And that's, you know, it's, it's open, uh, it's open free for use activity. So it's consistent with HL7. And at some point you can ballot these things at HL7. But what what we uh, have talked with orders and observation about in, in the last working group meeting was uh, let's, let's start this by saying, okay, here's, if you will, the, the data class or the pattern uh, for quantitative lab and ballot that, uh, you know, and, and, and then ballot one for coded lab and ballot one for, uh, you know, titered lab so that you know exactly those patterns. And then a lot of the subsequent detail you can actually do in tables and other things that are, that are pretty, pretty easy. But, uh, you know, that, that's sort of the approach that we've been thinking about, uh, you know, out of the STEMI group and also out of uh, the participants in Logica. Again, noting self self serving and bias, but my my only my only uh, salvation is that you know we're not doing this as a proprietary activity. We're doing this as an open uh, collaboration and and sharing with everybody uh, you know uh, license uh, free for use. And so, uh, but uh, I, 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 if somebody else was doing it too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I the way I see the work that that Logica is doing is you know is is kind of feeding this process and and i think you know what prompted the <clears throat> sorry the the real desire <clears throat> to get something like this out so that so that we could talk about it was um the fact that it's obviously missing you know there's this big gap between hey we need something about blood pressure hey we need something about about conditions to um, to something that is truly interoperable, and and I and also say that I think people are ready. Uh, I'll be so bold as to say to be told what to do, right? I mean, they're they're kind of like, okay, we've tried a bunch of ways where we've just done our own thing, 
And that's been great for us, but, um, but now we're being told we have to interoperate and we actually have to tell the patient what we're doing. And the patient's be, <clears throat> gonna be getting this from more than one place. And so we admit that, that while well, you know, you're gonna let us do whatever we wanna do inside of our environment, but when we talk to the, talk to the world, when we interoperate, um, just tell us what you want us to do and we'll figure out how to jam what we've got in there. And, um, and so I think there is a real opportunity. Um, I, you know, I wish that ONC would say, you're right, this first pass was basically to get everybody thinking. And now, um, you know, again, I think you're right. They need to hear it loud and clear from many places that what we want as a community, not just the guys who are gonna make you know, we live logical models, right? So, so for us to say, hey, you should be doing a logical model is, is a little self-serving, but, um, but I think that they need to hear it loud and clear. And, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they'll say, okay, this next thing, we're ready to make that huge leap and say, here are very specific things. And then things like HL7 can say that thing, here's what the fire thing is. You know, it actually is, is broad enough that we talk about using a, a semi-logical model. But, but uh, you know, I guess I'm tired of waiting. <laughs> and so I'm a little worried that if we say, okay, we're gonna do these onesie twosies as Logica finishes or whatever finishes inside of fire, or we figure out how to get, you know, it's gonna be piecemeal. And I guarantee you, as you all know, the EHR vendors and the community is just gonna go, okay, forget it. They're not, you know, we'll just keep doing our own thing. Well, so <clears throat> somehow we have to fill the gap quickly, the whole okay. gap. Let me, make a, let me make a comment, and then uh, in the interest of time, we'll probably have to move on soon. Um, uh, this is absolutely great, um, but it's, um, uh, the problem is not new. Uh, there are, have been many multiple attempts to address this problem, because just a list of data elements, an underspecified label that everybody thinks they understand it, everybody has a different understanding, and the differences impede interoperability. Um, this problem has existed for decades. Um, we had the archetypes work that came out of the Open EHR project. We had a, a, um, an attempt that never went anywhere many years ago at HL7 to standardize patterns for certain things, uh, clinical things, but also other kinds of things. Um, that we dealt with in the administrative area in, in HL7. Um, there was a tremendous amount of effort put in by SIMI to try to standardize uh, the clinical models. I mean, it is clear to anyone that thinks about this that um, uh, a single data field or a single data item doesn't have an awful lot of meaning without an enormous amount of contextual structural information around it. Um, uh, for years, the term info effort at HL7 um, just tried to deal with the single problem of um, uh, where the balance of the meaning should be in different kinds of things. And the question of the answer, you know, assertions versus observations. Um, uh, one of the reasons this has taken so long and everyone is frustrated that they don't have an answer in hand and they just know what to do. Um, is um, it's a hard problem. And um, uh, I, I hear what you're saying, uh, Rob McClure, on um, uh, the difficulties with doing this piecemeal. Um, but um, the efforts that are tried to solve this kind of globally um, uh, didn't fare all that well in the past. Um, and I don't have a magic answer or a silver bullet. Um, it's critically needed. Um, uh, uh, having just a list of data elements out there um, uh, is kind of in the place of, of data representation for interoperability where we were decades ago with just a list of words on a piece of paper that people said, well, this is the vocabulary you want to use as a terminology. And it was just a, 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 little, a little table of codes in an Excel file or something. Um, so um, uh, it's really good. I'm not sure um, the best way to move it forward quickly. Um, uh, 
putting more support in terms of people saying this is a good idea um, uh, to um, the government agencies, to the standards bodies, um, I think is all a very, very good thing to do because it is desperately needed. Um, but it, um, uh, I've kind of moved out of the world of having kind of big box architecture solutions for things and saying these problems are too hard to do in, in a moonshot. We have to figure out a way to kind of nibble away at them uh, in a small way where everything is going in the same strategic direction. Um, and uh, I, think, I think your proposal um, is excellent, Dan, and thank you very much. And it's the right way to get started on this um, with the caveat that there have been a lot of attempts to get started on solving this problem in different ways with different groups of people in different venues and different continents. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm interested in solving the problem because as Rob said, um, implementers wanna know what to do. Um, they don't have the time or the patience or the luxury of pontificating about it um, for many, many hours or weeks or months. Um, to figure out the meaning behind uh, the right thing to do and what should be right. They just want to say, what data do I capture from users? Well, how do I build my user interface? What do I put where and send it to whom? And um, uh, I, we have various tools for doing that. I mean, there are profiles in, in FHIR. There's a lot of work going on in that. Um, there is the tremendous amount of work that NIST has done um, for uh, doing uh, usage profiles for very, very specific use cases um, uh, for version two uh, messaging for things like immunizations and laboratory results, ELR. Um, I think these are all kind of good efforts, um, but they're all over the place. They're kind of scattered. Um, uh, I, I don't know the best way to bring these together, but we do need to solve this problem because without it, we'll just send codes around and we still won't have an effective interoperability of so, knowledge. So I'll, I'll just, so I, I wonder if one thing that we could do from Loink's perspective is to one, as an organization, promote, you know, I mean, you know, it may use this as an example, perhaps, but in a sense say, we really think there needs to be more clarity and a logical model approach and we think that you know it's probably reasonable to tackle this on a on a uh, you know current USCDI data class by data class um, approach. So maybe we you know that issue. I agree. Moonshots hard. Talk to some and 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 figure out from the link perspective maybe one or two of the current so-called data classes that we think should actually have a logical model approach that are directly related to what Loink could say something about. So in other words, take a piece of what Dan's proposing and say, you know, here's an example of what we think needs to occur. And, you know, kind of put Loink's, uh, you know, word behind it saying, um, you know, we would certainly align with anything that ONC could put together that is a, a detailed logical model that clarifies what the meaning is in this data class. I mean, pick a couple. Yeah, that would be an approach. Yeah. And this is Swapna, I, I totally agree. I guess I'm also wondering if it would make sense. And Dan, I know we actually have the HSC meeting next week, but, you know, given that this isn't just something related to Loink, it's applies to you know multiple standards organizations if maybe it could be something that could be brought from that group uh, you know sort of across SDOs instead of just from one well uh, considering that I have a little influence over the yeah. agenda of that meeting <laughs> exactly and <laughs> that there will be OC representatives there uh i think that's a good idea um and well, i guess what i would like from this group is you know i guess confirmation that uh you know the one community feels like this is an important um topic or issue to bring forward uh to that group it's not necessarily just dan's idea yeah absolutely and sorry i hadn't realized my video was on so yes <laughs> Nice to see you. I'm just, I'm not, I was nodding like, uh, but anyway, yeah, no, I, I think it is important. And I think, you know, but it'll just be a stronger voice, I think, coming from the group.
So how do we modify our, or do we need to tweak our document ontology subcommittee proposal to align with this any better, or it, does it move in the right direction enough, do you think? I personally think- answer, Yeah, we don't have to answer now, but you know. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we should submit what we have um, because I think it does, you know, I mean, it, it goes a small step in that direction, mm. or maybe some pieces of it do. Um, but I also think, um, David is, <laughs> sorry, yeah, I just had the background, like, what's going that. on? <laughs> Getting confused. Um, but yeah, I mean, mm. just given that we've, you know, we've done a lot of work on it at this point, I mean, we don't know how long, it's not like ONC is going to respond right away, you know, we're going to propose something, they're going to all of a sudden say, oh, great, like, let's just change the whole thing. They're not going to do that. And so I feel like at least we'll still take some steps to make mm -hmm. things a little bit better by yep. submitting what we have. Yeah, I, I, I would go ahead with your proposal, Dave. I, that That's, you know, if you will, that's that's inside the box of what U.S., you know, what, what they would be expecting. And mm -hmm. and Dan's is way outside the box, and it's going to take a while to, to work it into the box. Uh, so I would go ahead and take do yeah submit the proposals that you have and start working on on the bigger solution uh, as dan has outlined it um, is that, even if there's even if they're willing and and excited about it the processes they have to work through are going to point to a prolonged <laughs> a prolonged uh path uh, you know to to where we want to get to so. Yep. Yeah, I think that's exactly the right approach. All right. Well, thank you very, very much, Dan. That was uh, that was excellent and uh, good work. Um, are there any further questions on this? I think we have a proposal. Uh, excuse me, a update from uh, Jamie on the agenda. Is that right? Yes. All right, I'd like to turn it over to Jamie to get uh, updates on the uh, CMS LT PAC um, assessments and uh, anything else that you'd like to give an update on, Jamie. Okay, okay, this is not maybe as interesting of a um, uh, discussion item, but um, very important nonetheless, so uh, important work at least. Um, so I'm gonna give a quick update here on what we've been doing with CMS and their long-term post-acute care assessments. Um, and this is kind of a repeat from Swapna's uh, discussion on um, Tuesday with updates related to CMS. But we are on year five of the five-year contract uh, to represent their long-term post-acute care assessments, um, including the ones that you see listed there. And the goal is to stay ahead, you know, six to 12 months ahead of the requirement dates so that implementers can um, begin um, processing those. Um, before the requirement goes into effect. And then we currently are ahead of schedule because of COVID-19. So we've been already creating um, all the codes and the structure and everything that's needed for future assessments, assuming they were gonna go into effect, but because of that, they've been delayed uh, because of COVID. So um, we meet bi-weekly uh, with the team to discuss any issues, um, review anything, um, any draft panels, things like that. Um, and if needed, um, we've been meeting additionally to go over other related topics. And currently, um, with it's actually the timing, you know, with COVID, uh, for, you know, of course is unfortunate, but um, with that, we've, it's given us time to really uh, look at the link timing across these assessments, which can vary. So some assessments are within a three-day assessment period and others are within a seven-day assessment period or others. So it may range. Um, those are the two common ones. But um, there's been some work around trying to unify the link timing across these assessments. And several efforts encourage this direction, including a fire implementation guide for PAC providers um, that's been um, uh, worked on by the PASIO project team. And then as well as uh, the codes that are recommended, the link code specifically that are recommended for functional status and or disability on the ISA uh, page. And we'll look uh, more at that here in a minute. Um, but all of these have 
kind of brought up the need to unify this timing because there's just in order to have a simplified list of LOINC codes essentially. Um, and so report period um, was decided to be used instead of three day, seven day, and so on. Um, so for example, we can look at a couple here where these are related to the ability to walk um, 10 feet, 150 feet, whatever it might be. But you can see if we sort on component here, how we've got you know, several terms that only differ by their timing, essentially. Um, whether they were able to walk 10 feet during that three-day assessment period or 10 feet at a point in time. Um, in reviewing the assessments, we've been looking at like, what did they really mean? Were they really looking at their functional, their usual functional ability over that three-day assessment period, seven-day assessment period, whatever it might be. Um, so over just a report period, were they really looking at that usual functional ability? And if so, then those terms we're gonna, are going to map to report period terms, rather than having separate terms for every different type of reporting period. Um, if it really was a point in time measurement, like goals, for instance, what is their goal, their functional goal? Um, that would be mapped to a point in time term. So we'll be keeping those um, just because that's what that represents and then anything that's over a given reporting period will be mapped to a single report period code. So for the LTPACs, um, there's the FOSSI version one that was published in the 2.68 release, this last release in June. Uh, that was the first to include these new report period codes. Um, and then right now we're working on the IRFPI and the LCDS, both the active versions and the ones that um, are currently act inactive, so future versions. Um, these will be updated in the upcoming December 2020 release. And then MDS and OASIS will likely be updated during the June 2021 release. Um, the amount of work that it takes to swap out these codes and um, do all the work to make sure we've covered everything takes a while. So uh, we just want to make sure that we're doing it right. Um, and then eventually the CMS specific three day, seven day, et cetera terms will be discouraged and mapped to report period terms. Um, the other thing we're doing with them, we're currently working with CMS, ONC, POSSE, and others on how to best represent the collection of codes recommended for this functional status and our disability reporting specifically. And the goal is to just e easily identify what codes are needed to be able to access them. Um, and then having them maintained by a single source and updated with each link release. So uh, the idea is all new report period terms plus a few others like those PT ones for goals that I mentioned will be included in this value set or group um, but not all the variations, the three day, seven day, everything. Um, since we really want to encourage the use of the same terms, the report period codes. So actually let's look, I just want to look quickly at the current page, the ISA page specifically for this functional status and or disability. So we're specifically talking about this ISA page and we've been working with them on this. Right now, the way that it's set up is we have the specific panel codes for each assessment um, that contains for the functional abilities and so on. So implementers have to go into each of these and find the codes that they need, um, which is challenging and almost overwhelming when they come to this page. So the idea is to kind of have a point to one value set, one collection for their specific use case. And, and it may be that we have, you know, an overall one that contains goals, prior functioning, and usual functioning, and whatever else. Um, or we have uh, those broken out, you know, into uh, depending on what the what their use is. So, but essentially trying to simplify this, make it simple so that they're not having to look across forms and find each of the codes they need. And so um, the options that we've been discussing with them, which comes back to Rob's 
uh, thing about trying to unify all of this, which we desperately would like. We, uh, and, it, and it, again, it, it's an evolution over time. So we didn't have the fire. We didn't have other, you know, certain ways. We didn't have groups initially, link groups. Um, and so the very first thing we had to kind of group together a set of codes, like for HEDIS, um, was these convenience grouper panels that we have in Link, where we hold together all the codes that are used for like HEDIS. Um, and so this is one of the first options that we proposed to CMS was to create these panels in Link that contained all the you know, codes that, that they were interested in. Um, but then in, more recently, we've talked to them more about potentially creating a Link group that would hold them together, which could also be represented as a fire value set, which we've done with many of, with all of our other groups, link groups, um, or just creating a specific link fire value set, um, similar to this one that we have for public health case reporting. And I think it's helpful just to look at this real quick. So you can see in here, um, this fire value set is defined by, you know, related to public health case reporting. And it has, age, race, information. You can just see all the codes that are included within this value set. So, so I'm going to jump uh -huh. in. So Jamie, this to me looks like a group, <laughs> but oh, it just yes. happens to be represented as a fire value set. So, oh. so I, 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 think I would be- I think we have a specific group for public health case reporting. Um, I mean, I think, I think that's the big question is that these things can be represented different ways and we can, we can um, tag it. Yeah, but so and, here, here's here's uh -huh. what here's what I was going to jump ahead though and say, I, I would be, you know, this is probably just a personal opinion, although I might be able to back it up more than that. <laughs> but I think we shouldn't use a value set in the context of Link itself. Now this is different for people who are creating and linking things to data elements where they don't own the terminology, but for Link. I think what Loink should do is if you think that there's, if we think there's something valuable in terms of a collection mm -hmm. and that Loink wants to represent via a Loink construct, we should use our constructs in the context of the code system instead of crafting a value set that's yet another context that people have to be able to figure out how to use. So I would suggest that whenever this situation arises, and uh, this isn't speaking to then where's a panel fit, but I would say we make a group if it's not, you know, if it's basically, you know, collected based on meta, uh, you know, metadata about our own codes that we only know. And, um, and then anyone who wanted to use it, i.e. if we said, hey, here's this group, we would use the, the standard fire value set process just to say point to this group and it would naturally be a value set. Right, so I, yeah. I, that's, I would rather us do that than add yet another construct for grouping that happens to be value sets because that's how people use our stuff. It's not how we define stuff ourselves. Now, having said that, in part that's driven by the fact that we have these things like groups. If we didn't have groups, we might want to use value sets to do that, but you've got groups, which essentially are a way of crafting a value set. So I, I think, you know, we got to kind of deal with the fact that we've already painted the corners and let's use the ones that we've got. That's my opinion. I wanted to make a quick note. And, about and I do see Dan is laughing as I said that, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll let others talk. I, I did want to make quick, a quick note about convenience groupers. Um, the challenge that we've had with this in the past, um, and Dan, I'm sure you can relate to this, is that we've created these LOINC codes for these panels that contain these sets of codes and people end up using those link codes, which weren't intended to be used um, as an order or as um, any other thing. It was just Document. meant to hold together a collection of codes. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and we end up having challenges with that because that code becomes then this um, report, for instance, it's representing this report and collection of codes. And I, and I, I, I see a, you know, that it would be great to separate out true panels, link panels that are used for ordering and reporting from these convenience group type things or yeah, collections. Definitely have, that's definitely a problem. Um, people, uh, if there's a code in the terminology, 
people often don't take the time and trouble to understand that the code is representing a different uh, foundational uh, a notion within the terminology and it shouldn't necessarily be used as an order or as a result or as an observation. Yeah. So, can I and, jump in? Then the answer is get rid of groups and make value sets. Yeah, and, well, and absolutely well, convenient well, we grouper the, panels should you know, go away. Um, not loon groups, the panel codes that are used for convenience grouper panels. Sorry, this the convenience grouper, the grouper part of that. So these are actually loink codes that are created as panels. Yeah. So they're not the group aspect because loink groups are defined by the LG code. That's exactly right. Yes. So we, we've done in, in loink, we've differentiated uh, within the syntax of the concept ID uh, in flagrant violation of some desiderata re recommendations, but um, we've done things uh, that uh, make it easy, easy on just examining the code to see quickly if it's being misused. Um, uh, value sets are, um, are a convenient and handy representation structure for all kinds of collections for all kinds of other purposes. And because they're easy and convenient, people are starting to use and misuse them all over the place. And so there are some concerns about inappropriate use. Um, but I think notionally, we have the idea of groups of things. And um, whether those groups are represented um, within the terminology syntactical code constructs or they're represented using another representational form, I think is a separate, very important question, but a separate question. Um, uh, so um, I think as we're seeing this great uptake in value set usage throughout the health IT community, we're going to see an increase in misbehavior, which always happens when new stuff gets popular. Um, and it just is what it is. Um, so, so I, yeah, so it's, it's, it's lunchtime out West now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, We're so out of time. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I like the suggestion that the panels, groups and value sets work group that I already signed up for uh, <laughs> is going to take this on. Yep. Yep. That's great. All right. Thank you very, very much, Jamie. Um, yes. Are, are we, am I, am I confused about the time? Are we over time already? Yeah, we're a few minutes over time, but we could. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't... No, that's okay, but we're almost done. So we could keep going if that's okay. Yeah, with so well, we have, um, do any committee members have specific updates they would like to give? Oh, oh I mean, I don't stand doesn't anyone else. All right, well, that's a short agenda. Item. <laughs> uh, that's good. So um, uh, conference logistics, um, future conferences. Swapna, you want to yep. give us a little update? Yes, on and I just have a couple of slides here. Next 12 months or so. All right, can you guys see my slide? Yep. yep. Okay, awesome. Um, and so basically, we had talked about this a little bit on Tuesday, and then I actually forgot to do the follow-up with the lab meeting uh, yesterday, but uh, so... You guys, uh, hopefully you will have some input on this, but you know, just in terms of the structure of the conferences, this conference was four shorter days that we could maximize participation. And then we also introduced a combined lab and clinical committee meeting time. And I guess I just wanted to get some thoughts on, you know, do people like that format? Do people prefer the entirely separate lab and clinical meetings? Um, do people prefer having just the day of workshops and then having the committee meetings, you know, be for more hours. Um, you know, one thing is that the way we did the schedule this time, it was a little bit choppy. And so, you know, even for this meeting, we had like the hour before lunch and then the hour after lunch. And then, you know, it's not a great way to continue a long discussion. Um, so, you know, so one consideration is certainly having more hours, uh, you know, dedicated to each meeting and all in a row. Um, but that's one thing. And then, Oops, sorry. Oh, and then, you know, starting, so not next year, but the year after, um, in general, we were thinking we were gonna have the spring meeting in either Indianapolis or Salt Lake City, but at least for the Indy meeting, you know, we've basically outgrown the meeting space at Reagan Street, and even the last in-person conference, which I think was about a year and a half ago, in June, I guess, 2019, 
um, you know, for the educational, the workshops, basically the, the meeting rooms are not big enough. And so, you know, even if we stay in Indianapolis, I think we're going to have to expand and go somewhere else. Um, and it turns out Indy is actually very expensive for hosting conferences. And so, you know, we're thinking about possibly um, just considering other places in the U.S. as well. And so I wanted to get people's thoughts on that. And then um, finally, just in terms of, you know, I guess a couple of years ago when we had decided to have an international conference and go to the new schedule, at that time, the committee, the both the lab and the clinical committee had agreed to uh, have half or full day virtual meetings uh, in between the twice yearly in-person conferences. But we haven't actually done that yet. Um, and, you know, and I, I think at least from my perspective, like the lab and the documentology and nursing subcommittee meetings, which happen monthly, are actually going really well. So I'm wondering if instead of having, you know, a virtual meeting in between the in-person ones, um, like for a whole day, should we just add maybe a quarterly clinical committee meeting as well um, and just make it a little bit less formal? So... Just Swap now. I put the poll up. Yeah. I see people are responding. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so as that oh, continues, we do have a, <laughs> yeah, this, this screen's popping around, right? Um, <laughs> so we do have a couple of comments. Um, with the virtual format, it's really nice to have shorter days. And then also, Andrea is asking, have we considered East Coast, Central, and West Coast rotation? Um, no, I had not considered that, um, but that's, that's a good idea. It definitely makes it more challenging. Oh, are you talking about just the U.S. meetings? I believe so, yes. Okay, yeah. No, that's that's a good idea. Yes. Um, I think, you know, uh, up until this point, we had basically just been looking at East Coast and West Coast in terms of Indian Salt Lake, or not West Coast, but East Coast and Mountain Time in terms of Indianapolis and uh, Salt Lake City. But, you know, I think that would definitely be a consideration. I think just the further West we get, I think it becomes more challenging for people in, you know, Europe and further east to be able to participate just with the time zone changes. Uh, and Dan's getting volunteered for um, RTI. <laughs> oh, to host? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Good idea. Carolina's okay. nice. <laughs> okay, so we have about a 60% vote rate. Um, we can leave this up for just a moment longer or we can um, go ahead and close that out. I'll we, you call that? I don't know if anybody else had this, but being a panelist, I wasn't able to vote. So, okay. I don't know if all the panelists. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Hosts can't vote. Yeah. Yep. So, all the so people like, on the like committee couldn't ideas. vote. <laughs> I like these ideas, and I think uh, um, uh, it's, more, it's more convenient in some ways to have shorter, more frequent things. Um, but because everybody has so many meetings and so many conferences and events that they're involved in, yep. um, uh, more frequent things means more often conflicts. So I don't quite know how to best to balance that. Um, uh, the in-person meetings are, have always been great because you can just, well, you're away and so you're there and you're just focused on those things. Um, with the virtual meetings, you know, you're constantly being pulled in nine different directions by other responsibilities and things. Um, I think um, uh, I think the suggestion of moving things around is a good one, um, but um, the time zones on the virtual meetings are extraordinarily challenging. Um, I'm in a couple of projects that have both Europeans and Australians on the project. And we have a two hour window of four days a week that everybody can be on without um, being really inconvenienced time wise. And, um, and it's, just, it's just the way it is. We have to work around that. Um, so thank you for all of the work that you're doing on trying to find all the options on this and figuring out something that's gonna work uh, well for as many people as possible. Yeah, and we're really hoping that, you know, after March, we will be able to go back to the in-person uh, meetings because there's just, you know, there's just something about them that you can't reproduce in the virtual That's right. That's right. So you, you, get, you get an enormous amount of uh, ad hoc information exchange um, that you can't foresee, you can't plan ahead for, 
that just bubbles up because of conversations and something comes into people's heads. Um, and, and that is the real benefit of in-person, one of the primary benefits of in-person meetings. Um, we will, we'll have to see how the pandemic plays out globally um, over the next 12 months. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to resume face-to-face -face meetings for many of these events. Um, uh, but um, the first six months of next year is going to be a very touch and go kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, uh, just, it's just the nature of reality, which sometimes is not as comfortable and friendly as we'd like it to be. Um, so anything else, Swapna? Uh, no, that's all I had. And I guess just to thank everybody for sticking with us. And um, yeah, I know it's been a long week, but I think it's been really exciting. Well, it's been a wonderful week. Uh, we've had fabulous uh, presentations, um, extraordinary participation. Um, we've had uh, over 260 registrants um, at the meeting, which is uh, far more than we've had in face-to-face -face meetings in the past, at least the ones that I've been involved yeah. in. Um, uh, we've had coverage in 40 different countries around the world, which is also uh, gratifying and extraordinary. And, uh, you know, my heartfelt thanks to the participations uh, from all of these uh, folks from around the world, uh, some of whom uh, the, the time zone differences are not the most convenient thing in the world. Um, but it's been great, the different perspectives and contributions um, from so many attendees uh, in so many places around the world is absolutely uh, invaluable. So my heartfelt thanks out to everyone involved in this wonderful activity. And I want to give special uh, shout out and thanks to um, uh, the LOINC team and the LOINC staff for putting on an absolutely fabulous conference and uh, doing just a wonderful job with the technology. And um, uh, the technology uh, in this conference uh, has gone smoother than in the other three virtual conferences that I've been part of. So, oh, uh, good. Well, yay. So, that is, that is so, <laughs> so great to hear. And, uh, uh, and so thank you all very, very much. Thank, thank you, Ted, for that. Um, I'll just take a minute here. For some reason, we weren't able to allow the panelists to vote like, a, like we were before. But if you do want to have an opinion on that survey, I'll share the results really quickly just so everybody can see. Um, uh, give us a shout. We'll, we would love to have your opinion on this. Yep, you know where to find us. Right. So, um, and thank you, Ted, for that, um, that uh, gratitude to us. I do want to point out that although you see and hear um, some of us more than others, there are several behind the scenes that are working just as hard as, as you see us doing. And so kudos to them. Um, one of them is sitting over my shoulder and his name is Tim. So <laughs> shout out to everyone that you didn't hear or see um, on our team. It's a great team. So thank you so much. All right. Hey. Now, now we got to let Stan get some lunch. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Group, group hug. <laughs> all righty. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.